I'll retreat uh, something. Uh, okay. I'm taking hitting go live. Go live. Setting up in about five, four, three, two, one. Hey, everybody, you are watching and listening to the We Are Rising podcast. This is your host, Andrew Benjamin. I am joined by my co-host, Jay Christian Gary, who I think is it is in the line for uh, being the next rising girl. Hell no. I would much rather, I mean, to tell you the truth, I would much rather be sleeping with a rising girl and not in the way that you think. <laughs> But still, what's good, y'all? I hope y'all can ignore the fact that I'm basically bright-eyed and bushy-tailed as I've been up all night. And I need some sleep, but I'm fighting it just to be on here. And speaking of fighting it, the man that we got as our guest today has basically been, I guess you would say, the fight savior when it comes down to translating Japanese fight fans' thoughts and bringing them all to the international forefront, or just chat, or just putting over fight fans in general over the time that he's been on Twitter. We would like to get him to introduce more about himself. Here's Kyra Fan. How are you doing, sir? Hello, howdy, howdy do. I think you pumped me up a bit too much, but I'm um, happy to be here. Uh, happy to be talking about Japanese combat sports and kickboxing. Okay. Uh, so I got to ask right off the bat, uh, Kyra fan. Uh, so the match 2022 took this long, apparently, uh, for this fight to happen. Talk through tension. I got to ask, do you still think it's happening, even though we're about a week or less than a week out? What, 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 what's the next, what's the worst thing that could happen next that could possibly try to, to derail this whole thing? Cause it seems like everything has happened like at this point. Well, the one thing I've been expecting, but that hasn't happened so far is Takeru getting injured. And, uh-huh. you know, the guy either hits so hard or his fists are so brittle, but, you know, I feel like he gets injured every three months or so. Uh, and, you know, I can only assume since the fight hasn't been canceled at this point that he actually has been injured and he's just so dedicated to making this go through that he's just going to hide it and go into the ring. I was going to, you know, I was gonna say, mm-hmm. I was gonna, I was gonna say, I'm having flashbacks to Mayweather Pacquiao. That you know, he's he's gonna hide his injury, his uh, whatever injuries he's, ha- he's having, just for the yeah, sake. The shoulder, yeah, yeah, the shoulder, yeah. If, if it's at least it's his hand, I'm sure that he's had he's fought, he's fought with a broken hand before. Um, so he's I don't want to say that's like any that's less than a uh, shoulder injury, but like yeah, no, like I'm hope I hope these guys are kept in bubble wrap and like some. Some like I don't want them in Tokyo. I want them like I hope that they're like all like in the countryside where like nobody's around, where they can't like get hit by a car or something. I hope that like there's just some sort of measure to like let this happen. Let, yeah, let this happen. I mean, I don't know, man. I don't know if you've seen sparring footage from Takeru and what they do over at Crest, but it is probably some of the most brutal sparring that they do in any gym whatsoever. It's like mm-hmm. people like Takeru regularly spar with cruiserweights and, you know, one of the, uh, uh, his senpai is a guy that's like 65 kilograms, uh, regularly posts himself of getting knocked out in sparring by people who are hundred kgs. So oh, God. I can only hope that uh, he's taking himself, um, you know, he's taking care of himself, but I can't speak to that from uh, historical experience. The funniest thing I learned was that you remember that whole thing with the TJ Dillashaw, uh, where he was, uh, where he got uh, knocked out, or TJ gave him that sucker punch at the at yeah the, after yeah the, yeah the, the, the sparring. So apparently, I was told uh, uh, Charles Jewett, who we have on the show quite often, said apparently that his that uh Takaru's gym does that quite often as well. We're like so, yeah, yeah it wouldn't surprise me. Um, and like recently. I don't know if you've heard this bar, you probably had, but Tucker mentioned uh, in an interview that he knocked TJ down a couple of times in sparring. It wouldn't surprise me if he was the one that was being too hard initially and TJ was just reprising. Are we getting are we getting like a ring Nakai thing and whatever what, the thing with Azawa where the where she's gonna where she's like, oh you, did you hear the, see that whole thing? We're like we're yeah, uh, man, <laughs> Rin Nakai is a whole different, you know, can of worms, right? Uh, I sort of feel really bad for her, and it's also really funny 
Um, <laughs> I can't speak on it. It's yeah, it's an awkward situation. Oh no, it is, it is. But uh, we're well, we're not talking about Ring the Kai today. We're talking about the match 2022 live from the Tokyo Dome this Saturday night, Sunday morning for a lot of us. Um, and I guess the first thing I'm going to just say is, well, Karev, you're going to be lucky. You're going to be watching it. I'm assuming you're not going to be at the Tokyo Dome, right? Excuse me. Oh, yeah. No, I am. I oh, you're going to? Oh, so were you I the got, one who, you bought the two dollars tickets? Or was that you? I did not. I got pleb tickets that are only worth like 500 bucks each. Uh, they're the second cheapest uh, tickets in the arena. Well, uh, did you have to do the lottery to get those tickets? No, no. I was uh, I was just staking out for new ticket releases, and I just managed to squeeze in. But they sold out in about, uh, I'm tempted to say, 30 minutes or an hour after they went live. Even the front row ones that were worth 30K. So, yeah, it was a darn close run thing. Um, so do we know who the who is the person or persons that have purchased these thirty thousand dollar tickets and why why they have done that? Or is it uh, or can we or or is there or can we suspect that they might be uh, suited men who might have some uh, I don't know some ink on their shoulders? Well, the uh, fun thing is that you know they're all front row tickets, so you can just see their faces all live. They uh, mm-hmm. I think um. A lot of them are supposedly going to uh, just longtime sponsors, uh, you know, people who aren't getting gifted the tickets. It's just people who sponsor took care of intention so long that they are so devoted. They want to be ringside for this. But it'll be funny to see the faces of people um, when the event actually starts. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I guess the I guess might as well get it out of the way. Um, no Fuji TV, uh, no international stream for us folk. Um, you were the one who was basically who basically uh, was covering the entire press conference where they were based where Sakaki Bar was like, oh hey, we don't have Fuji TV more, and uh, then uh, we got the sad news that unfortunately us international folk are going to once again get screwed and seeing mm. this show legally. So uh, can I just get? I just want to hear your own personal thoughts on this whole Fuji TV thing. And this whole Bima, t- if, if, if it's to be believed that it's Bima TV who are the ones who are being, uh, are the ones who are blocking this uh, potential international stream. Yeah, well, here's the thing, right? Like, I just feel really, really bad for Takeru. So, four years or so, when Takeru won his third K1 belt, you know, he just won the K1 Grand Prix, and he was doing a speech in front of the Saitama Super Arena. And basically... The guy, you know, after knocking out two guys and uh, beating another one to a pulp, started crying. And he said, you know, when I was a kid, I got into um, Japanese combat sports because I watched K-1 on TV. And I saw Andy Hug. And he was such an inspiration to me as a small kid that someone who was also a small fighter could go out and beat up people bigger than them. So that's why I wanted to do K-1. But by the time he actually became a professional, K1 was off of television, um, you know, and it became a place where even when he was an active K1 fighter, no one would knew that he was, no one would know he was still fighting or that K1 even existed. So, you know, three years ago, he basically made this pledge saying, by the time I retire, I will get K1 back on TV. I will make it so that my legacy is a place where new kids coming into combat sports can see this happening live on national television and find heroes like Andy Hug uh, was to me. And this was his chance to do it because, you know, K1 and Ryzen and Rise have all had that long-standing rivalry and, you know, they've been basically kicked off the air. So this cross-promotion was a place for him to basically get up and show the world what he's been working on. And it got snatched away from him, you know, just weeks before it was supposed to happen. So I worry a bit about what it's doing to Takeru's motivation and obviously to Tenshin's as well, because this is Tenshin's last fight. And to be honest, right, like he's had a lot of fights on TV and the last couple have been somewhat iffy, mostly exhibitions, you know, 
random boxing things that Ryzen might have to pull together for him last moment. I'm sure he wanted to end on a high note as well. So uh, I, I just feel for the fighters. It's a big deal. And I think it's sort of hard to comprehend if you're not in the country. Because over here, there's only, what, I forget, like five or six major television networks. So if you're fighting on TV, that means you have an audience of 10 million people, uh, best case. Uh, you know, Bob Sapp was fighting in front of uh, 30, 40 million people back in the heyday. So it's not just like, you know, it's not like the UFC is on Fox or whatever and a couple million or a couple hundred thousand watch. It's basically everyone in the country is watching and it's just such a huge sea change. Uh, I worry a bit about the motivation of the fighters. Um, do you, well, in terms of, of the TV, do you, do you think that's more, you think if there's, when it comes to motivate, do you mean the K1 fire specifically? Cause, or do you mean every fire that's on this card? Everyone, I think. Because uh-huh. here's a fact, right? Even if there is Huji or not, the amount of money that people are going to make or is basically the same. Uh, I think Ryzen only makes about 10% or something of their revenue is off of uh, Fuji TV broadcast. So it's not a revenue thing. Most of it comes from gate. And given the fact that all the tickets sold out immediately, despite being priced five to 10 times what they normally are, uh, means that, you know, both of these guys are probably going to walk away with multi-million paydays. Uh, They're probably going to set a new record for pay-per-views in Japan as well. But yeah, the reason why anyone wants to become a fighter isn't necessarily to make money, right? It's to basically get up on TV, become a national hero, inspire new uh, people to walk in their footsteps. And that's sort of an opportunity that's been snatched away from them. And, you know, that's not just yeah. Akira, that's not just tension, that's the same for everyone. And you know what, Kara and Andrew, you were asking me this when we talked about it last night. And that is when it comes down to tension. I mean, as a matter of fact, no, when it comes down to this fight card, do you think that if tension and Takaru lose, I mean, do you think that if tension and Takaru becomes a dud, that it will probably stain both of their legacies? I think it depends, right? I think for Takeru, yes. The importance of this fight for Takeru is much bigger than it is for Tension for a couple of reasons. One is that, you know, this is Tension's last fight. So he's basically saying his career in kickboxing is over. And, you know, he's moving on to the next thing. So win or lose this one, it's not a big deal for him. For Takeru, losing this fight means that he has to go into retirement. And this is a note that his fight ends on especially if it's a boring fight, right? Uh, The other side is, you know, if you consider the trajectory of their careers, Takeru used to be on top, but tension came up and sort of surpassed him in terms of mainstream recognition. But he's always been saying, hey, if the fight gets made, I will fight him and I will knock him out and I will prove that K1 is number one. So if he loses here, it both invalidates everything that he's been working on in his 30-something fight win streak, but also sort of the status of K1 as a promotion. Exactly. And when it comes down to the undercard, do you think that regardless of how the main event does, that if the undercard suffers or if the undercard is just all decisions, then this card might be a dud? Well, it's a 17 fight card or something, 16 fights, I think. So I think it's going to drag even if every fight is a barn burner. Um, Probably, realistically, um, even if they had gotten a Fuji TV deal, they were probably only going to broadcast Takeru versus Tension. Outside of Takeru and Tension, there's probably three or four fighters, I would say, really matter for both organizations in terms of setting up their next pipeline. So it's not a coincidence here that besides Takeru versus Tension, there's two more uh, basically champion class versus champion class matches happening at Bantamweight and around that level. Because they aren't just matching together Takeru versus Tension, they're matching together the next generation's uh, hopes versus each other. So 
you know, the winner of that basically has the potential to become the next Takiro Tenshin. And if that fight doesn't go well, then yeah, it could become a dud for either or both organs. So um, I, w- I was just asking about the, uh, about the sorry, uh, sorry, Christian, uh, about, about the TV things. So do you, is it at all foreseeable? Probably not, but I'll, I'll ask anyway. Uh, do you think that some one of the other networks, Asai, TBS, uh, NTV, uh, do you think maybe last minute any of them could potentially pick it up? Or Almost just- never. Okay. The thing is, right, it's a reputational thing. It's not a commercial value thing. Mm-hmm. But if all the other broadcasters are looking at the show right now and saying, well, Fuji has been in this business longer than we have, and they discovered something that scared them, so they jumped off. And if it is some sort of association with um, organized crime or things of that nature, then that has a potential to sink their broadcast network. So even if this is a surefire thing for from a ratings war point of view, I don't think anyone's going to touch it. Their best bet is that they can convince Fuji to come back. But even, you know, Takeru seems to have given up on that one. So mm. my, I wouldn't, People accuse me of being pessimistic, but I would not have staked my hopes. On that. I, 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 why, why be pessimistic? Look, look what happens all the time, and you know, with with J kick J M M A. Whenever like, yeah, so like, but you know, happens. I mean, it's part of the hero's journey, right? Jury doesn't just become UFC champ. First, he has to get knocked out by King Mo, and then mm. go through seven years of trials and errors before he becomes champion. Mm-hmm. And Takeru didn't get this fight when he first asked for it. He had to endure for seven years and everybody trashed on him and gave up on hope on him, but then he still uh, persevered and got this fight done. So, you know, things will never be, uh, I think things are always going to be worse over the next year or two than what people expect. But over the next five to 10 years, uh, things are going to be a lot better than what we expect it to be. Because I will tell you, like, Five, seven years uh, before today, I would have never, uh, you know, expected that kickboxing was returning to the Tokyo Dome. Mm. I think uh, when we had you, we had you on for K Festa back in our audio only days. I, yeah. I did ask you uh, if you thought that talk retention would ever happen. And I think you did say resoundingly like, no, it's not going to happen. Yeah, probably. And come to think of it, that K Festa show was the last event Anywhere in the world before COVID truly hit the fan. Yeah. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a great show. Yeah, I came uh, three. <laughs> oh, man. There was a lot of... Um, uh, that's a whole different story. There was a lot story. of backlash. Like, <laughs> that, 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 global backlash because it was on the New York Times. And uh, yeah. also, also, it just it feels like 10 years ago, that K-Festa 2020. I feel, I feel, it doesn't even feel like it happened two years ago. I no. felt like I, that, that feels like almost a fever dream at this point. Um, oh, definitely. So, I mean, so uh, were you, uh, uh, so you, you, you didn't think this fight was ever going to happen. Um, a lot of people, I, 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 I think fairly didn't fi- think it was going to happen. Um, do you think so far the hype, do you feel that the hype around this fight is warranted of, of the, of the weight? Um, and I'll also Ask in addition to that, I was talk- I was talking with uh, Charles Jewett, uh, CJ from Soka yeah. and he says that he feels like that there's no talk, am- uh, very little talk among it um, uh, outside the J combat sphere. He doesn't feel like he has not. See- he has- I think he said that he's not seen a lot of talk on it on like talk shows, variety shows. Now yeah. I don't know if that's also in addition because of the Fuji TV thing. You know, now it's like becoming like things people don't want to touch. But also when it comes to like these things you know a lot of times i don't hear about boxing shows till like the day of or to the day before like i didn't even know that in a way donaire hell was happening until the day until i saw on twitter oh 2 p.m or whatever time it was uh that they're fighting so i what what is it what do you perceive as the hype around this fight so far karev yeah i think that's a pretty apropos um comparison to boxing right the entire business of combat sports especially in japan is moving from a place where it was a mainstream event where people knew about it weeks before it happened and built it up to a place where a handful of really hardcore fans really care about it, but most people don't recognize it's happening. And, you know, the hardcore fans might pay more money to keep it afloat, but, you know, 
it's not like we have a Mike Tyson or a Muhammad Ali anymore. You know, even the biggest uh, boxing superstars go out and um, they only sell pay per views. Nobody knows what they're fighting, and you know, also in way, De Niro, right? Like I was walking around Tokyo, and maybe a week before the event happened, uh, there was a whole stream of um, you know marketing done for it you know i saw commercials for it on tv i walked into uh stations and they had lined uh basically the walls with posters and stuff uh and those are all you know coordinated marketing attacks done by major ad agencies here like dentsu and hakodo uh i think the weird thing is the the match hasn't gotten any of that in terms of uh open marketing done and probably that's a big purport, you know, the Fuji TV deal it has a lot to do with it. If I had to guess, I would imagine that Fuji TV would have been the point guard in the committee for doing a lot of this outward marketing activity because they're the ones with the air slot and they're the one with the active ongoing relationships with major ad agencies. Mm-hmm. You know, if I was a business manager, I would probably spend three to five million or something just for the marketing of this event. And that gets me television commercials, that gets me ads all over Tokyo. And, you know, people see that it's happening and are willing to go out and tune in for it. But, you know, if there is no free TV for people to tune into, then they're not going to do it. And, uh, you know, the people who will buy pay-per-view would know about it anyway, so... It's gone from something that could have been a pretty mainstream event to something that's really not hush hush, but uh, going under the radar that a small subset of people are super passionate about. I think. Now, way- oh, go ahead. Now, here's the thing, Kyrie fan, and I hate to interrupt, even though if you know me, it's kind of my thing. <laughs> but still, considering the fact that you mentioned the Nonito Donier now you in the way fight the rematch that just happened that barely lasted two rounds. Do you think it's kind of odd that Amazon Prime Video in Japan has done, I mean, done more in promoting that one fight, Donia versus, I mean, Donia versus Inoue 2, than either of the three promoters for Ryzen, Rise, and K1 for the Tension Takaru fight in general? There's probably two things I want to say about that, right? One is just business model-wise. If you consider how Abema is selling this versus um, how Amazon Prime was selling In a Way versus Donair. Um, In a Way versus Donair was a free fight to watch if you have Amazon Prime, right? So you already have a multi-million audience and you can go out and look at this fight if they were aware that it was happening. They were probably more hoping people use that fight as a opening to go out and watch you know a uh watch stuff on amazon prime as opposed to you know um if you were to think whether it's in no way promoting amazon or amazon promoting it in no way it was always going to be in no way promoting amazon because people are going to watch that fight on amazon prime and come back for more amazon offerings abema obviously is selling this as a 40 dollars pay-per-view so, you know, it's not the, necessarily that they need to get a wide audience for this and get people to come into their platform because uh, the Abema platform is already pretty big. It's more converting those people into becoming a paid audience. So, you know, I would say, yeah, I mean, Amazon probably has more incentive to go out and promote this. The other side of it is the entire marketing campaign of this whole event has been somewhat odd because it really feels like it's being marketed through a committee. Um, What I mean by that is, you know, if you were to watch a Ryzen card, right, before Ryzen comes on, there was like a series of Ryzen confession episodes, which is all done by Sado Ezo. And there's a pretty consistent visual theme and there's a pretty consistent marketing done. Uh, And then, but with this one, like there's like, three or four different types of posters being made, one by Abema, one by the Risen guys, and then uh, two more by K1 and Rise. And it feels like everyone is trying to have a say in how they're marketing this and not coordinating. Uh, So, you know, I wonder if there's some backwards, uh, back and forth being done of that. 
uh, so uh, one of the other things I also want to ask, so about Bima, uh, $40 or 40 of Bima points, if uh, you're going by, if we're going by that, um, and, uh, but not available to us. And I know you have a lot of, of Geico Gujin, uh kickboxing friends, Karev, who probably, when they saw the news, probably just, you know, uh, the uh, meme, uh, hello, darkness, my old friend, probably played in their head. Um, so mm-hmm. I want to know what you think, you know, about this whole Abima, uh, if, if it's to be believe that they're the ones who are blocking this whole international streaming thing. And is it, uh, do you even believe, do you believe it's them? Do you think it's, is it just, is it all three of the, is it every entity at this point? Was it something that they weren't even pro- probably even thinking of at some point? Like, what do you think of this whole no international streaming thing for this fight? That's, you know, that's a lot of us have been waiting for a long time. Yeah. I mean, in my point, uh, my point of view is that it's disappointing, but I am not at all surprised. And to be honest, I don't think it's just a Bama. It's just, here's the thing, right? Like if you had, you know, three or four parties in this whole thing with a Bama, K1, Rise and Ryzen basically trying to do this. Every one of those points are, is a point of failure. And, you know, even before this, K1 has never officially made its product available live uh k1 japan i mean mm-hmm. and you know people wondered why that is um it could be a rights issue because k1 japan is a licensed org and maybe they might not have uh rights to operate outside of japan that much it might just be the philosophy of its uh owners and managers and you know abema you know they're selling this as a pay-per-view but if they want to sell a pay-per-view to international audiences they probably need to start thinking about producing english commentary english translated marketing materials maybe they don't want to go through the trouble of doing that it's just like if you considered how important international distribution was it probably wasn't that important to be frank with you right um like i i would be surprised if they would have sold more than a thousand pay-per-views and then if you think about who might not want to do it. There's just so many candidates of people who, uh, parties that might have uh, caused veto on it that I'm not surprised. I'm just disappointed. Oh, that was the, actually- Here's the thing, though. Mm-hmm. The last time K1 done anything regarding an international pay-per-view, I think it was in the final 16 in Croatia back in 2013. Aside from that, the last time they really distributed anything regarding like a regular pay-per-view package was back in 2003 when they done shows in the United States with ESPN. So you would have to basically think long and hard, haha, that's what she said, just to try and get K1 to play ball with other internationally owned streaming platforms and other international markets in general well actually i want to I'll go on, uh, right after all that because i did see i forgot who posted it but then i remember i think it was you or somebody else who had mentioned this about the K, about k1 so that k1 japan so k1 japan is actually borrowing the name of k1 from like a chinese entity i think it is or yeah China. i mean it's and that pretty complicated been, but basically that, may, that, that they only have the right to be k1 in japan but not internationally and that could have been that could have been legitimately like a factor, like why you can't show this internationally because just they don't own the rights to promote themselves internationally. It's possible. It's speculation, but that's what some of the theories are saying. You know, like um, basically, Chris, you were mentioning the 2003 and the 2013 events, but they were done by different operating companies, so to speak. Mm-hmm. The actual old school K1 organization as in the guys who own the rights to it and were doing all the promotions and putting things out on ESPN and HDNet and what have you, that basically died back in 2011 or something. And Mm. the rights to the K1 name was bought out by this guy called Mr. Kim, uh, who manages a place called K1 Global. And they tried to do a couple events between 2013 to 2015, I think. but basically, as an organization, they didn't really get that big of a start because they couldn't really go back to Japan without anyone running things locally. So there was no market there. 
they did a bunch of shows in Europe and Thailand and what have you that petered out. So that org is basically dead. And back in 2014 or 2015 or something, uh, they seem to have licensed out the right to use a K1 brand name to a kickboxing organization in Japan uh, called Crush. And Crush basically ran with it. Initially, they were trying to promote themselves as K1 World League, but it seems like they had some rights issue and they renamed themselves to K1 Japan. So since then, people have been assuming that, you know, maybe K1 Japan only really has the rights to do business within Japan. And even though their parent right holder is basically dead in the water and not doing anything besides retweeting K1 Japan stuff, uh, you know, maybe they don't actually have the right to go out and do a full global uh, promotion. Hmm, I see. Uh, yeah. We have uh, two comments from Leona Flathis, uh, who says that's a different company entirely. This company is merely wearing their skin and Abima now, own now owns a stake in it. And yeah. Uh, uh, and now, and Bima, that's owned by Cyberfight, if I'm correct, right? Cyber Agent. Cyber Agent. Cyber uh, Agent. Yeah. yeah. Cyberfight is a. That's a pro wrestling thing. That's yeah. a pro. That's, no, that's, yeah, but it's a, actually a cyber subsidiary of Cyber oh. Agent. Oh, my God. Okay. So, yeah. And they also own K1 a bit. Yeah. So. Basically, they're owned by the same damn company. Um, yeah. He also says K1 Global is, quote, run by Mike Kim, a Hong, uh, a, a Hong Kong corporate company run by a Korean who has given su the successor to Jalico to keep him away from the family business. And those who have negotiated with him thought he was tremendously stupid. Crow Cop shamed him into security. I remember that. I think that was the thing that yeah. Crow Cop like, posted on Facebook, like, this guy fucked me out of money or something. And yeah. uh, Okay, I remember and, this now. Oh, my God. And that's also sort of a part of why this whole drama between K1 Japan and everyone ex else exists, right? Because K1 Japan wasn't actually the old school K1 organization. Mm -hmm. They just basically uh, stole, you know, they basically cut the face off the corpse and started wearing it by themselves. Um, so these uh, companies like Rise were also founded around the same time Crush was. And it was sort of a partner organization to the old K1. So even before this whole Takara versus Tension thing was coming out, Rise has been continuously uh, been on a crusade to try to crush K1 Japan. They even formed sort of like a coalition between other kickboxing organizations called Blade to basically try to make a new K1 and stop K1 Japan before it got rolling. That's actually where Tension Asagawa first broke out. So mm. it's sort of in the backdrop of all of this fight, a succession war between Rise and K1 about who really is a legitimate heir to the old K1 dynasty. Um, and uh, well, um, so what? So okay, so basically, so this is so the all of these companies are so this whole show is happening because. <laughs> I want to make sure I understand. It says because the old K one. Okay, so basically they want to say, "Oh no, we're the old, we're the original K one." Kind of, they kind of like they want to say, "Oh no, we're the actual successor to to the old K one that ex that we that we think of when we think of traditional K one." Yeah. Oh my god. And okay. that's sort of you know been the backdrop of the last seven years because mm. K one Japan was growing, doing its own thing. And, you know, guys like Takeru were saying, hey, we're going to build K1 Japan up, get back on TV, make K1 great again, so to speak. <laughs> and then people like Tenshin were saying, you guys aren't K1. I grew up watching K1 and you guys aren't it. Uh, so is that yeah. where the whole lawsuit or with K1 and then Rise and Ryzen, that whole thing? Is that how that that came about? Um, uh, it was part of it but this whole thing has been go going on since basically 2014 okay. and yeah you know, the lawsuit only came out like 2016 or 17 is that, so is, that lawsuit, a, is that lawsuit still going on or no i that... got dropped okay okay because I, I i couldn't find anything that was actually dropped on uh on english uh wikipedia or whatever um mm. okay so I, I, was, I was gonna say i was hoping it was dropped because if it was not that would have been some awkward uh meetings between all these companies yeah you know it was sorry but yeah, it's classic uh i forget what the technical term is but it's intimidation uh -huh. lawsuits right no one was wanting to actually go to court or anything over it it's just uh back then 
K1 still has some business with uh, Ryzen and Rise. Mm. Uh, and since Rise was starting to take over its spot, uh, they were hoping that the lawsuit could scare Rise off of uh, Risen for a bit. But, oh, uh, Leona, water under the bridge. Water, yeah. Well, okay, uh, Leona continues. Uh, K1 was continuously referred to as Shinsei uh, K1. And... Uh, Shinsai, I think that pronounced Shin. No, that's Shinsei. Shinsei K1 yeah. and Takaru dedicated one of his post fight speeches to basically asking, uh, please just call us K1. I see. Okay. Yeah, he did that. Uh, I think that was 2018 or 17. Um, so, uh, you know what? You know, we've, we've talked a lot about the behind the, 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 the match. Let's talk about the actual match. Takaru versus Tension, Karefan. What do you think is going to happen? Who do you think is going to win? How do you think this fight goes? And uh, yes, tell us every every little every little thought that you have on on the main events. Yeah, here's the thing. Um, I really want Takara to win, and it's really hard for me to imagine a scenario where he does so. I think the last time a poll official poll was done on it, seventy percent of people said they wanted Takara to win. Uh, but when you listen to the expert commentary from people like Masato or some of the other kickboxer uh, people, Shinya Aoki. yeah, Shinya Aoki, <laughs> they're all calling it for tension, and it's not hard to see why. Because if it's a uh, three round fight, right? Um, people were expecting it to be five rounds, but it ended up being three rounds, and it ended up being uh, at a weight class of 58 kgs with four with a day of weigh-in to see whether people are more than uh, four kgs rehydrated. Um, it's a lot of factors going up against Takeru. And I think there's probably two things that are worth talking about. One is if it's just three rounds, right? Tension has a speed advantage. So he almost certainly is going to take the first round. Um, Takeru is, as you guys know, much more of a long-term pressure fighter, but it's really hard to apply pressure and then corner an opponent and then win at least two rounds definitively um, with that style, you know, especially against a guy who's a southpaw and an elusive counter striker. The last person Takeru faced that was close to that description was Murakoshi. And that ended up being a Takeru victory, but it did go to a decision and it was sort of a contested one. So Almost everyone commentating on this fight says if Tension really wants to win, he doesn't even have to engage. He can just point fight. He'll definitely win uh, round one. He'll probably win at least one of the other two rounds. So, you know, it's a win there. The biggest hope Takeru has is that all this talk about, you know, this being Tension's last fight and he got all the rules rigged in his favor. Hopefully that sort of inflames Tension a bit. So Tension wants to close in and put a definitive stamp on it. And if he plays a bit irrationally and tries to go for the kill, then that's the sort of fight Takeru wins it under. That's what happened with uh, Leona Pedas, who a lot of people thought was going to, you know, have all the tools to outpoint Takeru and uh, basically control the fight. But, you know, it was a two-round fight. And then somewhere between uh, the midpoint of the first round um, to the end of it, he started landing on Takeru a bit, and he probably thought he can go in, take this, put a definitive win on, and that's when you start getting into exchanges. And if you get into exchanges with Takeru, you don't win. So, you know, that's probably the best case scenario for Takeru, that tension gets so hot-headed that he throws caution to the wind and um, takes the risks that he don't ne he doesn't necessarily have to. But at that point, you're counting on so many mistakes for Tension to make. I, I don't know if it's happening. People say Tension hasn't looked so good recently. Um, and that's true to an extent. But what that means is that Tension isn't going out and then, you know, blasting people out with combinations. But he is consistently taking three-round fights, you know, gauging people in the first round and then uh, basically controlling the fight of the third. So... I expect this fight to look like that. You the see, other thing, oh, and sorry. I won't go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. The other thing, and I won't dwell on this, is that it's sort of a hellish wake up for Takeru because he was expecting this fight, you know, as you guys might remember, back in December, right? 
So he was already expecting to go down to kilo, uh, to, to kilograms or so um, back then and was cutting weight and was basically le uh, leading a uh, lifestyle where he's only getting one meal in a day. And it's the fight's been extended and now it's been six months since then, during which time Takeru has always been training nonstop and been uh, subsiding on a you know, starvation diet. Takeru, the last time something like this happened was back in uh, 2014 when he had to go down 2.5 kgs to fight uh, Taiga. And you know, even though he got a KO in that fight, he was vomiting his stomach out uh, up to minutes before the fight actually started. And he basically lost the first two rounds and only managed to get a uh, back fist in, in the third. So, you know, he, he's not someone that's worked historically well with uh, dramatic weight, prolonged weight cuts. He's also not someone that's worked well versus South Ball counter strikers. Um, I think all the factors are up against him. So the other the other thing I, I want to ask is so when it comes down to I've always said that tension has speed, power, and precision. And that's why he's at one point, you know, was able to knock out the people the way he did. And I'm one of those people who definitely feels like, oh, he hasn't been as the same, or he hasn't chosen to fight the same way that he used to. Um meanwhile, Taku is pretty much has fought the same way uh that he's been fighting since he's been on the ascent. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's fair. I think he's added a few new things to his game. You know, like over the last couple of years, he's become a uh, much more buried kicker, I say. He mm -hmm. uses his front leg kicks um, over the last four or five years uh, so that he can get, you know, in crescent kicks. He can throw in normal tapes. He can throw in inside low legs, uh, low kicks. And basically, you know, try to confuse people at a distance without uh, even getting into the boxing. So, you know, he has added a couple new tools to his arsenal, but it's mostly been him just being a meat grinder that somehow convinces people to jump in the ring with him. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, yeah. you know what? I'm going to go ahead and say this before I fall asleep. Because, again, I've been up all night, and it's close to 7 a.m. my time, so I might as well get this shit out the way real quick. I think that when it comes to this fight, it's a must-win for tension. Because, yeah, if Takaru loses via knockout, he can go ahead and, you know, walk back on his morals. He can basically be K-1 savior in another way like helping the next generation out. But as far as Tenshin Nasukawa, I mean, as far as Tenshin Nasukawa goes, in this fight against Takaru Sagawa, which is going to be contested at 128 pounds, which is awfully close to 58 kgs that you're talking about, Karev, I think that if Tenshin loses this fight, you can kiss that boxing career and everything that tension has built up over the last seven years goodbye, because that's basically his career going down the toilet, especially considering the negative reaction that the fight fans, not only in your neck of the woods, Karaya, but around the world have really been given tension since he first started lacing up a pair of gloves professionally. Might be, Chris. Um, we'll see, right? Thing is, I, you know, tension is Teflon. Nothing sticks to him, you know? <laughs> I mean, he fought that fight versus Mayweather, and he got blown out in the most ludicrous way ever. And yet, since then, all the Japanese fans say, you know, oh, what a brave challenge that he went on, and that's totally not on his record. And all mm -hmm. the Western fans say, well, that was totally rigged. And, you know, Tension wasn't even fighting properly. You know, he of was uh, taking a of dive. Course. So somehow that raised his stock. Um, and I can't stop well, but imagine I, this does the same. For a second, Karev, I would basically say the Western fans, all, the Western fans only said that the fight was rigged because half the times, hell, most of the time, they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. Might be. 
<laughs> uh, we got we got two comments, and I'm curious to know uh, um, our friend uh, Teep uh, from the junk. Uh, he wants to know, and correct, maybe you could tell us who's a betting favorite in Japan. Um, you know, I don't think there are official lines on it. Uh, the no DraftKings. There's no 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 DraftKings yeah. sponsors. No, Sadly, no. no. <laughs> Uh, I think the last official poll, poll had uh, Takeru up 70% versus 30 Um, I think all the expert consensus has been more in for favor of tension. Uh, but, you know, for the purposes of this, you can basically say it's 50-50. Um, and uh, the other... Uh... Uh, the other question uh, we oh, we got we got uh, Slavonak who says tension still has a massive following in Japan even if he loses his talk room in my opinion just going off that it seems like tension got a lot of hate after the whole Kana cheating thing that seemed when he when he was uh doing his uh heel turn arc and uh it seemed seemingly I feel like Takaru is almost a baby face going to this because he's defending not all it, it, he's the one who's been this it feels like the he's this fight is all I feel like he's put more pressure on him on this fight than tension seemingly has and, and i think that's definitely true he just did a uh, interview on tokyo sports it there was a full page article and the headline was defeat means death oh so, god okay you know. okay that's a shame i wasn't expecting that but um okay well i hope it does i hope i hope I hope for that sake he doesn't lose in that case i mean i mean well actually so actually going back to the fight uh correct do you see this going to the extension round or can you see a knockout before then or a decision? Um, I don't think it's going to the extension round. If you expect it to go to the extension round, you'd have to believe there's three really even rounds or, you know, one round for each and a draw. This is Japanese judging. Don't forget. Sure. So. <laughs> but I imagine either tension blows him out or takes the control decision. Um, or Takeru KOs him. So it's hard for me to imagine a extension. Um, what, uh, it's, and, and so it's from, from you're talking with other fans, it seems like Takeru is the one that people are more are backing at this point. Does it seemingly? I, I think that's fair. I think the thing about Takeru is that he has always been this massive fanboy about combat sports in general. Not just kickboxing, which you mm. know he watched as a kid, but he's big into pro wrestling. He mentioned he wants to go into uh, MMA at one point. He's basically like he's made Who no MMA fights, obviously. Sorry, what's that? I mean, tension fought in four mixed martial arts. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I was talking uh, about Takeru. Oh right, Takeru Sagawa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Oh. But yeah, I think he's just a bit more relatable because, you know, Tension is this guy who his dad decided was going to become a next generation fighting celebrity. And he somehow had this 100 plus win amateur career and went into kickboxing and had a 30 or 40 win uh, kickboxing career. And that's amazing and everything. But, you know, Takeru is a guy that was basically considered to be the least talented kid in this karate dojo okay. and somehow uh, hung around and became a champion. So I think he's a bit more relatable. And that's not to say Tension is a bad person or that, you know, Tension doesn't have his uh, trials uh, that he's gone through. Um, but if you're someone like me, who's a millennial and saw uh, combat sports be at its height when you were a kid, and then go into decline. He's the one that's fighting for the cause that we all believed in. So it's really hard not to root for him. Uh, Slavonak asks in the chat, wouldn't Tension fans still watch because he's Tension? Uh, Tank Davis fans are necessarily are, are necessarily aren't necessarily general boxing fans, but they still watch Tanks because they're his fans. The other thing is that you know when he comes to the boxing, you know we'll you know. I'm assuming he's going to box in the United States. That's what I'm, that's what it, I feel well, like. You can stop assuming. I mean, you can stop assuming that because if tension loses this fight, who's to say he'll even be fighting on big cards in the United States when all he'll be fighting are basically cab drivers from Manila and Mexico city and places like that. I I know, but I do see what his point is. I do see what his point is. Is that that I think 
I think a lot of, I don't know if the promoters are even going to care at that point uh, about his, uh, especially American promoters who I don't even think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think it's two sided question, right? One is, will tension fans still stick around? And they definitely will. Mm-hmm. You know, tension fans still think that he has a shot versus Mayweather if he gets a rematch. <laughs> so, I mean, they are all the fight fans of Japanese combat sports, the guys are really invested in people like the Asakuras and tension and what have you. It's like an idol business, right? They don't follow the sport. They just follow the character and yeah. they will believe in them no matter what challenges they take on. So mm-hmm. he probably won't lose that audience. And yeah, I mean, I think he's probably hoping to get some sort of uh, boxing promoter deal overseas. And I don't think they're necessarily going to, focus so much on you know what was your last kickboxing fight right they'll just know him as a kid that fought mayweather that one time and that might just be enough Mm -hmm. um so has there been uh has there been any i'm curious to know have you has there been any word on like a ceremony that's going to happen before to um before they they fight uh karev like is there like some sort of I have to believe that there's going to be some sort of big thing that's going on before and they're just like they're just not going to come out and walk down the tokyo dome ramp and then bang the gong and then start the fight is there has been- i'd imagine you know they haven't uh made anything public so far but i'd imagine from the k1 side they'll probably bring their orchestra they have a uh ingrown orchestra that does a k1 theme for major takeru fights it's awesome by the way i at k festa that we were just talking about a while ago yeah <laughs> they were there it's, it's 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 the most awesome thing it's uh i think them and ksw have their own orchestra <laughs> um so oh, go and um from tension side tension mentioned at his last rise fight that he was a bit disappointed in their farewell ceremony because <laughs> uh they didn't bring out the guy that sings his uh opening theme uh he his walk is out yeah yes so uh, they might be trying to get him live but if there is confirmation on that side we'll probably get note a bit before the event actually happens. What I'm I mean, curious I'm to think of it, the guy in question, Ikichi Yazawa, is probably as old as Mick Jagger. I highly doubt anybody wants to see him strut across the stage. I mean, you think <laughs> that, but if you watch In No Way versus Daenerys, they also got some 70-year-old J-Rocker to do a live entrance for In No Way, so, you know. Right, right. Probably one of the most it. famous Probably one of the most famous J rockers in the world, and Tomoyasu Hote. Yeah. Um, oh, random note, but uh, it just got announced that uh, Yogi Mo, who sponsors Risen, is sponsoring the match. Okay. Are, 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 oh, okay, okay. Because I thought that they, I thought they weren't sponsoring Ryzen anymore. They weren't sponsoring the latest cards. I think they, uh, you know, got phased out in the annual turnover. But. Well, I also think isn't the guy who runs it like a big yeah Yusuke Yachi fan as well? And yeah, that's, and well, that was a no. <laughs> I think he got t- maybe he got maybe he got tired of seeing Yachi lose every match that he got that he got bef- or should have lost, you know, and like. Maybe that's why he, he, they pulled out and they're like, oh, okay, I'm going to go to the match instead. That, that I can find my new my new favorite toy there. It's possible. Um, Sadly, Yachi's not fighting, but uh, yeah, actually, they know it is, which is close. Uh, close, uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, I want to say, um, so who is on the who on this card? Who is not on there that you surprised didn't get like a spot? And I would also like to preface that by saying, um, was there probably an edict that former K1 fighters? that left were not allowed to be on the card because I was surprised that Taiga, Koji, um, I know Ren is not into kickboxing anymore, so he's in MMA. Um, uh, Hiroya, uh, I noticed that there were certain names that I thought like, oh, they might try to put them on the card, but like, uh, yeah, there was none of that. Do you, uh, is there any name that you wish that was on this card that uh, didn't make it? Yeah, I don't know if there was an edict, um, but if you consider those guys, you know, they're not necessarily on win streaks right now. So mm. I'm not super surprised, to be honest. I think if there was any hope, I'm a bit surprised they didn't end up doing Rukia versus Hiramoto Ren because they're both sort of characters. They've always both been going back and forth on uh, having Twitter B for the last couple of years. So mm. I think it would have been a 
a uh, good matchup character wise. Instead, they got him, uh, Rukia uh, Yamada Kose, who mm. is a rise champ that's very competent and also incredibly, uh, I wouldn't say unmarketable, but non marketed. He has like 600 Twitter followers, and Rukia was roasting him over it <laughs> on the presser. So, you know, I'm he's he's a matchup that's pretty competent in terms of his skill set, but a bit surprising that they didn't bring in Ren or someone that's a bit more marketable. Mm-hmm. Besides that, um, I'm a tad surprised no one from Ryzen or MMA in general is on this. No so, go me. Go, yeah. I, I... <laughs> well, I'm not too sad about no go me. I mean, oh, he okay. already embarrassed tension once, so you can't do it <laughs> twice in a year, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jamie, uh, Jamie, our good friend Jamie says, tension gets King Kazu to say cheerio and complains. What a brat. Is there something about that, uh, Karev? That, uh, is there a backstory? Oh, uh, was it King Kazu that was the one that, um, gave the farewell? Basically, at the uh, at his last rise fight, uh, his last kickboxing fight in his home uh, turf, they had this farewell video for him, uh, and a celebrity popped up on it. Maybe it was King Kazu. I thought maybe it was Yazawa, but I forget. Anyways, he watched the video and he was like, hmm, is that it? Nothing more. Okay, well, it's over, guys. So, you know, uh, people were, uh, people, I guess he expected a bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, I also want to, so Ted is going to bo- in the boxing. That's pretty much a dead, dead fact. What, what about Takru? I know he said he's going to retire, but is he, if he loses, do you foresee him doing, having to feel like he has to retire on a win? Or do you, do you think, regardless of outcome, he retires? I think he thinks he's going to retire. I think practically speaking, even if he loses in the most embarrassing manner, he probably would want to, you know, months after the fight happens, he would want to do a farewell in K1. So I'd imagine in that case, they would match him up against uh, Kaneko or some of the other next gen star uh, candidates. Otherwise, um, I don't, yeah, if Takeru wins, I don't actually expect him to retire anytime soon. He mm. would probably still campaign to get kickboxing back on TV. So, you know, maybe that might be through starting MMA or whatever, but he'll probably still do something fighting. Isn't he, maybe. doesn't he want to be a singer or something? Isn't that like one of his like side products is like making like J pop or like, like, like folksy songs or whatever. I remember seeing like he's a singer as well. He's a, uh, so Takira and Tension both are singers, so to speak, but. Tension is the one that's putting out professional singles and trying to sell something commercially. Tucker <laughs> hasn't done that, but he's just like a much naturally better singer. And he's been on like the Mass Singer and other singing karaoke shows. I th- okay. uh, he's always been super upfront that, you know, since he was in middle school, he wanted to get girls. So he's always been posing as a band man. And uh, <laughs> he'll probably continue that, but it's not serious. He's, <laughs> uh, fighters, uh, fighters do not make the best musicians let's be real <laughs> yeah now we got mikuru getting into the game as well why, why, why do fighters have to like why do fighters have to feel this need to to drop some beats i don't i never understood that We're i mean talking- i think it's an influencer thing right like if you're trying to move from fighting to being a youtuber or something youtuber you i probably, understand yeah. i understand youtuber but uh Slavonik says, I wouldn't really call attention a singer. <laughs> no. <Nah. Okay. laughs> um, uh, he put out a single. You can look it up. I would I, suggest I will, I, to it. I, I will take your word for it. I will, I will assume it exists and that, uh, that, it, that it's out there. Um, curious to know, Karev, what do you think is the worst outcome that could happen once the bell rings on this fight? What is the worst possible outcome that could like this uh, thing? Headbutt this- cut. <laughs> headbutt th- first 10 seconds. Yeah. Uh, 10 minute nut job intermission. I don't know. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. And I mean, it's even like everything before the fight has gone wrong in many, except in many for ways. injuries, except for and injuries. I mean, yeah. Um, oh, so I, what, what do you think about the future of kickboxing? Let's assume that both was, let's, let's assume that Takaru does retire regardless of outcome and tension goes to kickboxing. Who do you think can take up the mantle respectively for both K1 
and for Rise, if there's anybody even. Yeah, I mean, I think they're actually both fighting each other on this card. So, oh, already interestingly oh. enough, it's the uh, first fight of the night. But Kaneko Akihiro, um, he is a K1 55 kg champion. He's from Silver Wolf Gym, which is where Masado came from. And basically, the guy's a wrecking ball. Um, he basically annihilates his opponents with power in all of his last fights. And he just won the K1 Grand Prix after an incredible run in a um, 55 kg Grand Prix. And he's fighting uh, that night nice Suzuki, who is also the uh, mm. K- uh, rise candidate for being post-tension, who is their 55 kg champion. They're both young. They're both super aggressive. And I think, you know, uh, not to be too crass, but a whole big segment of the market isn't just being good, but it's also being pretty and good and getting, you know, the female audience into the crowd. So Mm -hmm. I think both of them has the potential to do it. Um, Actually, so, yeah, let's talk a little bit about other fights in this card. Um, (laughs) There's there's 100 million fights in this card. So Hmm? all I can say before I get off on here is that the only fights I'm looking forward to are the ones that basically have a bit of a rising connection to the card. Even if I was looking at this live, which I probably won't for reasons of, you know, a beamer. <laughs> Fuck them. But still, point of the matter is I'm looking forward to Taiju Shiratori versus Kongnakta Willasa Crick. I'm looking forward to Yama and Rin Sugiyama taking on Ryusei Ashizawa, mostly because of the press conference that happened. That was just crazy, very crazy, so to speak. Mm. And, I mean, I'm not really looking forward to you. No, it actually, I am looking forward to Bay Noah facing off against Hiromi Wajima, mostly because of the fact that I think that fight's going to be a banger as will Kaito Ono versus Masaaki Noiri, mostly because of the fact that Noiri Noiri was a former Glory Grand Slam tournament alum. Oh, and Kento Haraguchi versus Hideki Yamazaki. That fight's also going to rock, too. But still, though, I hate to basically put a dagger in my time, but I am tired as a dog, so... I'm going to let you, Andrew, and you, Kara, take the wheel on this one. It's been fun. But still, I'm about to go ahead and go. Because if I stay on here for long, I'm probably going to be asleep halfway through y'all talking. No but problem, yeah. Chris. Sounds good. No, take care, good. Chris. Thank you, Chris. We'll talk soon. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, we'll talk soon. Just want to give a quick plug. You know, follow me on Twitter at Focus Fights. Focus underscore fights that is. You can follow me at Chris Gary92 and at Christian Gary92, the latter on Instagram. But still, though, and I hate to basically conjure up Lenny Hart early, but still, we're all just having fun. We're glad that y'all are joining us. And even though we're in the middle of the show, please subscribe so you can get more great content like this. But other than that, I'm about to go. And as the great Lenny Hart always likes to say, So, yeah, see y'all guys later. Hope y'all have fun with the rest of the show. Oh, thank you, Chris. Um, actually, question, will Lenny Hart be on the show, uh, uh, Karev? Is there any, uh, are they bringing her? I on? don't think they've confirmed it. Who knows, uh, you know? I hope she is. I hope she is. Because regardless, she always brings, I, I, I've always been a fan of her. I don't know what your thoughts are on her, but, like, it would be just cool hearing her, you know, say once again, you know, doing her, to all to Lenny Harding on Takaru and everybody else's name who may never, you know, that may never happen, whoever's in K1. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I'm just, yeah, I'm not pessimistic, but I'm cautious because I don't know the extent to which um, Sakaki Bara and Ryzen are actually managing the uh-huh. marketing and the operations of this thing. Well, yeah, Hopefully, well, if, uh, K1 yeah. might put in their own people. Uh, yeah, well, they might put their own people in now, uh, after, uh, certain things, uh, became, uh, public. So who fair, knows? Fair. 
<laughs> who knows but yeah let's talk about some of the other fights um i think yeah i, yeah, I think ashizawa yaman is probably third fight i'm looking most forward to because of the press conference why what why, why was ashizawa why was he talking shit on yaman what did yaman ever do to him oh uh, well, <laughs> I, I forget how it started but you called him like I a school, they, high school boy or like like you never fought in a street fight or something it was like um it was something they, like oh yeah yeah okay so what happened was uh, all right i'm trying to remember this so maybe i got it wrong but i think yaman was saying you know k1 is below rise you guys have been isolated forever you're not you know a real fighting organization and uh Shizawa said hey you know we're will i'm willing to do open finger gloves fighting like you always do to show you that you know i can kick your ass uh and then yaman was basically making fun of his looks or something saying you know you look like a scrawny bitch and <laughs> she's i uh, was like well for one thing you've probably never been in an actual fight you like try to act like a thug but i know you're a college student so what's up with that and that's when yaman tried to rush him <laughs> it's very you know it's very uh middle school schoolyard uh fighting which is sort of why there's this whole charm about it i say also they're both uh, you know they're both pretty fun fighters too they mm -hmm. almost always get knock down and knock out the other guy uh in all the fights they've been and so it's sort of hard to uh see who wins mm -hmm. uh it was funny though the most memorable thing was i never seen security guard literally do his job and actually separate two fires almost two yeah, he when tackled he, him yeah where he tack well it was yeah it was like yeah like a tackle out of nowhere and like poor yaman hit his head on the back and i was and it looked really bad yeah, like, he oh. went to the hospital after that, apparently. So that's a 10 a round for Ashizawa. We got a, 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 we got a, a, a question from Jamie. Um, he said, beside the main event, what's a fight that K1 and Rise can't afford to lose? So I guess so in this case, yeah, which fight other than the main event would be is most important for K1, for respectively K1 and Rise to win? Mm, I think it's different for both orgs. For K1, they definitely want Kaneko to beat Suzuki, since Kaneko is probably their best shot at replacing Takeru. Mm. For Rise, uh, they probably want Haraguchi to step back up and become post-tension. Mm -hmm. So it'll be bad news if he loses to Yamazaki. But those two are probably the most must-wins in terms of a promotional health point of view. Um, well, you know what they should have done with the rules? You know, hey, it's three by three with one extension. You know what? Open finger gloves. Why, yeah. why not? Why not at this point? Every, you know, they, they, they this fight is, uh, the fights are null or, you know, going to be that, you know, just put in open finger gloves. Cause like, who cares at this point? I actually, You're using uh six ounce gloves, which is a good compromise. I'd say it's not quite four ounces, but you know, close. Uh, are you happy with the six ounce gloves or are you just like, ugh? Should have just gone with four guys. Well, I think it's Takeru who always breaks his fist in every fight he's been in. And those are with eight ounce gloves. So okay. uh, I am not, <laughs> I don't actually foresee him having a future in MMA given how thin the gloves are over there. Uh, Leona says, uh, Yaman got a degree in architecture because his dad went to prison when he was young and his mom got cancer. So there's nobody in the family unit to help. Interesting guy. Um, that's a very inspirational story for why you're a college educated person <laughs> i.e not a thug <laughs> i just do i like to think that i like the fact that like oh yeah you're not a thug is like what set him off and was like you, you're questioning <laughs> you're questioning my thugness how dare you um let's see oh uh leona asked do you think the characterization of kaneko as a barely little literate simpleton hurts now that he's hope that he, now that he's a hope for the future yeah, so there's a bit of backstory for this, right? Mm -hmm. um, Kaneko, the guy I've been hyping up, um, he's he's not stupid, but he's really unpolite in Japan, right? Like you're supposed to be uh, speak with respect towards your elders and what have you. But one of the first days when he went to the gym, Masato came in, and Masato was this great kickboxing legend of 10, 20 years ago. And he was just like, sup, Masato. And everyone freaked out because he wasn't referring to him with the proper honorifics. 
So mm-hmm. since then, they basically treated him as sort of a meat devouring caveman. Um, <laughs> but he's not stupid. He's just a uh, weird dude. Um, and so what is it about him that make you see him being the future, potential future? Well, I both uh, Suzuki or uh, and um, can echo as as a future stars for their uh, respective promotions. What makes them the ones that stand out? Yeah, so, you know, both K1 and Rise have been doing this thing over the last three, four years where they're basically trying to find the next Tenshin or Takeru. And they've done a series of different Grand Prix between 53 gauges all the way up to 60 gauges uh, to see if anyone really breaks out. Uh, Kaneko, I'd say, is the one guy that has really broken out. He had a Grand Prix over the last, back in February or something, um, where he was facing a lot of pretty tough guys in his division. Uh, and he almost knocked all of them out besides his main rival, who was Kumura Masashi, um, who's also fighting on this card. So, you know, he's a guy with the most recent, most, ex, uh, ex, um, you know, greatest performance. He's also someone that, has a pretty uh, strong mix of just visual appeal and personal character. So, you know, it doesn't also doesn't hurt that he only has one loss over 15 fights. I mean. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, Suzuki, and- I'd say, is a bit weaker. Mm-hmm. Um, he did also have a fight with tension recently uh, that was fairly competitive. And he's also the Rise 55 KZ Grand uh 55 title holder but um rise is also a bit denser in terms of the talent pool that he they have down there so he's traded wins and losses with a couple more folks uh i also if i'm correct he's an osaka guy right suzuki yeah, uh yeah he's also okay osaka osaka fires are an interesting they're an interesting am, animal because they like people like him Kan nakamura they just have like a different i like their personalities compared to like a lot of the other fighters because they just have kind of like almost like a bad boy type of thing kind of like mm-hmm. a, a devil may care um and I, and I don't know if that does that come across when they when they speak um when they're speaking at press conferences um correct oh yeah definitely i think in um osaka there's a bigger pressure to be more performative and more funny so to speak so you know people tend to be a bit more flamboyant there cozy who's in uh you know, risen now. He almost never wins a fight, and he almost never gets a KO. But he still has one of the biggest audiences, just because you know of the way he handles himself. So mm. uh, we got. Uh, mm. So go, go ahead, go ahead. No, no. After you, Chris. No, not a big thing. Go ahead. Um, Liana says what he means is is he's a hot guy of huge muscles and great hair. Yeah, that's Kaneko. <laughs> he does not have great hair. He no, sort he of has like predator like dreads yes but it does not go well with him um and uh, Slavonak says i always thought shiratori and haraguchi were bigger than suzuki so actually let's talk about uh uh their respective fights uh taiju shiratori uh on this card who is uh, another te- uh team teppen person mm-hmm. um uh give me a moment i got i gotta get the card up because i've i haven't memorized any uh I'm not gonna pronounce the Thai guy's name. Uh, so Gunnar Rida Sakurik. I'll call him Kong, and then uh, Haraguchi's taking on uh, Hideaki, Yam- Hideaki Yamazaki. Yeah. So, um, what is Taiju's deal? Do you think that Taiju could be the next big thing, or is, or do you think? I think he's devoid of, of any charisma. When they uh, put a when he when they yeah. put a mic in front of him, he just n- does not seem like he is comfortable ever speaking on the mic. I think that's fair. I think back in. You know, three, four years ago, people mm-hmm. were expecting him to be the next big thing because mm-hmm. he had a pretty face. He was from Teppan Gym and, you know, he has pretty nice hands. He's a real boxing oriented guy that mm-hmm. if he gets his right distance, he can string together a series of really cool combos. Um, the thing with him is that they were hoping to build him up for a bit, but he sort of had his promotional momentum uh broken after a couple losses and closer fights uh the issue with him is that you know he's i wouldn't say he's one dimensional but he's a guy that has one mode of winning which is that he gets a mid-range and he can unleash his boxing combinations and take people out before they really get on their role and if he fails to do that then he basically can't set up 
uh, kickboxing fight. He doesn't really have the kicking tools to control range. He doesn't really bury, um, you know, verticalities between head hunting and body blows and going to further the legs. So people sort of started figuring him out. And one of the first people to figure him out was Haraguchi, who, you know, beat him, beat a couple other guys that were also, did he beat him? He beat a couple other guys who were also in his weight class and sort of became the kingpin of that weight class. But he also is sort of a not one dimensional, but limited fighter. He's a traditional karate guy, which means he's someone that doesn't have traditional boxing combinations. He's not someone that really is comfortable going for um, body, uh, sorry, punches to kick combinations that much. And that's sort of been showing with a couple of recent missteps in terms of losing to Pech Panurong, who was a glory champion. And basically he had no answers for him and just spammed spinning back kicks. Um, and then he's also been dropped by some less than illustrious fighters as well. So uh, how dare you insult Tyga? How dare you insult No, him? not Tyga. <laughs> I mean, I'm not even close. I'm talking about like uh this guy called the Tapper Juan Hottest Workout, who I think oh. was like 43 years old and mm. dropped him. And it was a darn close run thing. So, mm. you know, both, um, I think more than Shiratori, Haraguchi is a guy that they're hoping to uh, prop up as a next generation for Rise. It's just, yeah. it's a bit unfortunate with some of the recent fights that he's had. But the um, guy he's fighting, Yamazaki, is also pretty well noted. So, you know, it could be a new breakout moment for him. Both uh, of these fights are really good, though. Uh, yes. Um... Yeah, uh, what was uh, Haraguchi? Oh, sorry, when you were talking about being knocked out by lesser fighters, you were talking about Shiratori, right? Yeah, Shiratori. Okay, okay, uh, wait, yeah. no, Haraguchi got dropped by Tapper. One. Yes, yeah, okay. I thought you were, yeah. ta- I was, I thought you were ta- still talking about Shiratori because I was like, you said lesser fighters, like, oh, yeah, both of them I'll have d- sort of you, had. Nah, I'll do you until Taiga. <laughs> <laughs> they both had had a bit of similar, you know, career missteps. Mm-hmm. Well, I actually remember that, that Shiratori was on that losing streak for a while. Um, yeah. Uh, in Rise, uh, he he didn't he didn't advance in the uh, in the uh, tournament that they had that Rise. Um, yeah, and Aoki got him. Yeah, um, which by far, you know, listen, you know, you bend your head down, you know, that's what's going to happen. Also, I've always here's the thing: the Shiratori is always he always fights well until he doesn't, and then he yeah. kind of walks <laughs> up two left feet. And he's also someone who's he has the Stefan Struve problem where he's too tall for his own good sometimes, and he doesn't realize like, oh yeah, he doesn't the, fight tall. Yeah, that's the no. thing. He he does not. He do, when somebody gets into his pocket, he does. He is like not like. He seems to not to like know what to do when people like yeah. get in close to him. And if you somebody like Tiger who has power but has like no reach at all, like he is, he is his chin becomes quite suspect. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, that's a thing if you're a kickboxer but focus mostly on boxing combinations, right? Most of your range strikes end up becoming kicks. So if you're not super comfortable with them, then you're eventually going to let people into your guard. And there are guys who can, um, you know, basically fight close, even if they're tall, like uh, Mm -hmm. Sato Yoshihiro used to be really great at this because he had a whole slew of different uh, knees that he could lead into. Uh, Shiratori doesn't really have that. So, you know, it just becomes awkward and he gets good first rounds and then, phase in the second to third rounds i mean mm. he was losing in the boxing match versus koji so mm-hmm. that's sort of sad uh so Avanek says that haraguchi got dropped by lumpetch as well not because he was hurt but because he refuses to keep his he refuses to keep his feet on the ground <laughs> yeah. uh, oh man uh, um but that said uh I, i've talked more about the rise guys on these two fights but their opponents are also uh pretty interesting and also fairly beatable as well Mm-hmm. So sure, Tori's fighting Gunnapar, who is like this hyper, hyper aggressive Thai guy. He always goes out looking for the kill. He throws out his middle kicks like he's wielding an axe and trying to chop people in two. And, you know, he either smashes through his opponents or he gets caught. So, you know, it's a pretty cool stylistic matchup between two guys who are both somewhat uh, one dimensional, but hyper aggressive. And then Yamazaki is also a traditional um, karateka guy. 
uh, but also someone that's a lot more focused on throwing hands and getting KOs or getting KO'd. So <laughs> they're both good style matchups. And um, I would actually consider both of them, uh, both of Shiratori and Haraguchi to be underdogs in these matchups. Are you are you actually happy that they decided to do a uh, K1 versus rise from most of the fights it didn't do like oh you know rise versus rye guy k1 versus k1 that they kind of do like an interpromotional thing mm, i have a bit of a mixed opinion on it because i don't think <clears throat> the issue with it is that you need to have a k1 guy on every card and some of the k1 guys might be good but they don't really have great opponents i'm thinking about guys like rukia uh you know um satari and if you want to call him good they're all you know competent fighters that can carry their own fight but they don't have a counter uh fight you know they don't have a counter on the rise or other org side so it ends up with a couple of fights to seem a bit fillery so to speak i get what you're saying uh I, i'm curious to know what's uh, that co-main event that's an interesting co-main event because it sticks out because i did not think that you would have a shoot boxing guy taking on a k1 guy i figured it'd be a, a like it would be a haraguchi or a shiratori what why why would do you know as as an i think is this officially the co-main event i think um let me check it, is that i would say it's actually the best fight on the card in terms of skill level mm-hmm. uh but yeah yeah it is a co-main event yeah, so, talk about uh, Kaito and uh, Nori, uh, Nor- Nori. Yeah, so I don't know how familiar you are with Nori, but I would say he is the single best Japanese kickboxer over the last 20 years. Um, he basically started his career out in the last days of old K1, and he came out as this high schooler guy in the high school tournaments that they did. And the high school tournaments they did was basically a setup to let Hiroya win. So... No one expected a lot out of his opponents, but Nori was this kid coming out of um, Globe Karate, and he basically annihilated Hiroya on national TV. And that was when he was 16 years old. I think he's about 29 or something now. And since then, he's always been the front runner of Japanese kickboxing in front of international competition. After you know he uh, won the K1 high school, he went into Crush and uh, beat their youth champion uh, league. He went to glory, uh, made it to the finals of that. And then he went back to K1 Japan and he's been ruling it ever since. So basically Nori is sort of like the big boogeyman of Japanese kickboxing because he is a guy that's been around forever. He has a crazy skill set. He fights like an alien. You would not believe. He has knees that can jump above his head when you're standing right next to him and he has head kicks that can morph into front kicks it's amazing so you know he's basically like this video game character and kaito is this young guy coming out of shoot boxing and he's also been someone that's been putting together a pretty good streak so to speak uh, been saying, hey, I'm going to be the next guy to challenge the international competition at places like one championship. So Nori, who is basically like this old dog, is the last hurdle that Kaito has to get over to prove that he can be an uh, internationally relevant kickboxer. Um, I, uh, so Kaito, coming from shoot boxing, what do you, what do you think uh, what, uh, our, uh, our friend CJ thought that Ka- thinks that Kaito is going to get murdered in this because it's, it's the kickboxing rules? Do you see that happening with Kaito coming in, basically facing uh, Nori and basically his, uh, his, his rules, his, his game, his, his whole, yeah. What do you- we'll see. I mean, Kaito has been pretty competitive in kickboxing. He just fought uh, Bainoa in Rise and knocked him out in, I don't know, 30 seconds or something. Um, His primary weapons are his boxing. So he's not that big of a thrower. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be a fairly close matchup. I do see Nori's experience just being a bit too much for him, though. Uh, Well, the fight that I'm looking forward to the most, unfortunately, I don't... Actually, no, I do have the graphic, I think. Yes, I do. Is this one, Khan Nakamura and Leona Pettis. And yeah. this, I think this, you know, while that one may be a technical, a great technical fight, uh, Nori and, uh, and Kaito, 
This yeah. one could just be like an ugly fight, depending. Sure. And I th- and I think you know I think a lot of these kickboxes on the show um, are just so good that there may not be an ugly fight between the two. But I think these two can put on an ugly fights. Yeah, I mean, not to say you know they necessarily have ugly styles, but mm-hmm. there's been a bit of bad blood between them even before they went into this fight. Oh, there's always so, bad blood with Khan Nakamura. Khan Nakamura oh, hates, sure. hates everybody. He hates he hates everybody uh, before uh, before the fight. But yeah, what's what's tell us about the bad bad blood? So basically, in Khan Nakamura's division, there's a reigning Rise champion. He's not actually the Rise champion, right? So there's this guy called Naoki who beat. Um, Shiratori a couple of years ago, and Khan has been gangsing up to fight him. And le- back when they did their last Rise event, Leona actually went to the event to watch Naoki fight because people expected Naoki to win and be Leona's opponent. But then Naoki gets knocked out, and everyone's left feeling, you know, a bit uh, displaced. So they end up getting Khan Nakamura, who was the uh, up and rising guy and rise to fight Leona instead. And Leona has just been pretty frank about the fact that he sees him as a filler guy, a uh, sort of underdog. He literally said he is too weak of an opponent for me to face. And it's uh, just been a uh, pretty bad blood stewing between them. You know, like with Ashizawa and Yaman, when they get into a feud, you extort, you sort of expect them to be playing it up for comedy a bit. Uh, but I think Khan just really does not like Leona and vice versa. Mm-hmm. They both have a chip on their shoulder within their organizations, and now they're fighting each other. So, you know, it's do or die. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, well, here's the other thing. I always say this, that, that fighters from Osaka who have tattoos always have, like, plus 10 health, plus 10 stamina when they fight Osaka. Unfortunately, this fight will not be Osaka, so I don't think that Khan Nakamura will have that advantage. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, no, uh, like, uh, who do you think – so how, do you, you think that – do you think that Khan Nakamura will try to make this an ugly fight? Because he always, he always tries to bait people into, like, brawling with him. He always – Yeah, yeah. Do you think Pettis will fall for that, or do you think Pettis is just like, nah, I'm not going to gonna fall for your stupid games? I think he definitely will. I think, um, so if you remember back to the Takeru fight, mm-hmm. you know, he sort of got into the habit of brawling. He got confident in his power and chin and that did not pay dividends for him. Mm-hmm. Since then, he's had one fight, which is uh, up at 62.5 kgs. He was fighting a fairly competent fighter, but not someone that was outstanding in terms of their recognition. And he was basically, you know, trying to murk him and going for the kill all fight. So I think he's has something to prove. He wants to prove that, you know, he can get into brawls and win. Um, and historically, he has been able to. So I imagine Leona will try to play Khan at his own game. And that's probably when, you know, the biggest chance that Khan has. Mm-hmm. Um so uh, w- uh, we talked a little bit about, about, about Baynoa before, and I'm just curious to know this uh, Hiromi Wajima no Baynoa fight. It, do you think is this another? Is this gonna be another fight where Baynoa looks like he's gonna be great in the first minute, and then is gonna get, uh, he's gonna get knocked out? Because that seems to be happening a lot with him. Yeah, I mean, I think what's gonna happen is, I don't want to be too derogatory, but Baynoa is someone who's a character and has a personality and probably gets a bit more attention than uh, his KO ratio or win ratio would imply. Wajima is a guy that nobody pays attention to. He's also an Osaka guy, but he is really understated. He doesn't talk much. Uh, he Even when other people trash talk him, he only nods and approves, but he also has something like a 85% KO ratio and he's only lost to one guy. So, did, oh no, he lost to uh, two, uh, two or three guys actually. But recently, he's only lost to one guy. So, I think this is a scenario where Beno is going to come into the ring and realize that in boxing, kicking, setting up the pace of the fight, he's going to be completely outmatched. Mm-hmm. What do you think about Beynoa going to MMA? I actually think he's done better in MMA than in some of his recent kickboxing fights, to be honest with you. He's actually been training MMA for a pretty long time. And even though, you know, 
some of his MMA fights haven't um, been super clean. I remember that one fight where he was just circling around a guy and managed to get in one strike and get a KO. Uh, either way, I think at least there, you know, he has a bit more of an edge and a more clear game plan to be working towards. In kickboxing, he struggles a bit more because he can't quite, he doesn't, he's a pretty competent fighter in terms of being a karate guy, mm. but he doesn't really have a kickboxing singerism, if that makes sense. He's not someone that uses a ring to pressure people. He's not someone with boxing combinations to make the other guy scared of him. So sometimes he can just outlast three rounds and get in effective strikes. Other times he just, the opponent realizes they have nothing to fear from him and steamrolls him. So I like his MMA prospects a bit more than his kickboxing ones. I think there's a little bit of weight difference between the two, but do you think it would have been funny for shits and giggles if they did Nori versus Bainoa? Um, I, th- I think they're similar weight. Um, I think it will be pretty sad if they did that, to be honest with you. <laughs> and then, uh, and then uh, something, uh, Kaito and uh, Wajima. I don't know. Sometimes I, just I think like- Wajima could be interesting. Um, Kaito is a really flashy combination boxer. Wajima is a super pressure heavy power kicker. So mm-hmm. it's a good matchup of styles. Um, there's two heavyweights matches and i'm really uh, yeah. looking forward i'm looking forward to them because i have because heavyweight kickboxing is always interesting uh rikia yamashita versus sina karaminian and yuta ichida versus mamu Satari. uh why are they not doing sina versus kg for the 10th time i thought that i thought they're supposed to do a yearly match every year uh, <laughs> i think what happened actually is satari is also a big iranian guy yeah. who's been making his name in K1, but he's also been getting KOs. So they've sort of been over, uh, you know, putting the promotional emphasis on him. They announced his match on this card before uh, Cena, and mm. Cena based, literally replied to that with a middle finger emoji on Twitter. Ah. So, <laughs> you know, I think he basically pressured K1 into giving him this match. Uh, they, you know, it's not like Rise has a really robust division um, above 80 kgs or something. So it does feel a bit fillery. Um, but, you know, Cena and Satari are both really fun fighters in their own ways. So we'll mm-hmm. see how it goes. I mean, did, did you expect, I, I'm not even, I don't even know uh, uh, Yamashita that much. I have not seen anything of his. I know Uchida has been, uh, been in Rise and uh, Rise, I think he's had an MMA fat match in Rise, if I remember correctly. But yeah, uh, Yamashita, I have no idea. Like, what is, do you know anything about him at all? Um, so he's from, uh, I think, MA Kick, Axel Kick, which are sort of regional kickboxing wars. He's uh form you know his background is in karate i oh. haven't really watched that much fights of him he's all i know about him is that he's 175 centimeters and over 100 kilograms so you know i think um that tells a tale um he's a who's cup guy just like every other kickboxer he's fought in the who's cup like a dozen times um actually he's fought yuta uchida and lost him so that's uh uh, that's an interesting um mm, really? yeah um um i don't have the uh graphic for them but uh, i'm happy to see that one of the ibatas mutsuki i think rui's probably still ko'd from his uh last fight so that's why you couldn't make it to this uh that was unfortunate <laughs> to the show by uh shiro uh so i i'm cu- well how do you feel about uh Muts- this uh mutsuki bot uh ryamu fight mm, to be honest with you right it's sort of an outlier mm-hmm because it is a 55 kg fight, like the ones I've been hyping up between Kaneko and Suzuki or Shiro versus uh, Kimura Masashi. Mm-hmm. Um, but out of those divisions, I would say both Ebata Mutsuki and Ryamu are sort of um, the third string contenders in those divisions. Mm-hmm. And they match those two up. So Ryamu is a fun fighter. He's a crush champion right now. He's a uh, historically a taekwondo type guy that got a lot of cool spinning kick KOs. Um, He's been matched up uh, in K1 and came out on the wrong side of a really bad KO versus Kaneko. So it's a rebound fight for him. 
Um, Ivata, you know, he's also had a few missteps, so we'll see uh, how that fight goes for them. Uh, yeah, I was, I was about to say, I think that I think Mitsuki's problem. Uh, so if I, if I, okay, they're twins, I always get them confused. I think Rui's the one who fought, he's the one who fought tension, right? I think Rui fought tension, okay, and then Mutsuki lost versus Suzuki. Okay, it wasn't a KO, but uh, he was pressured really hard and you know was on the back foot. Okay, got okay, it's all coming back. Okay, um, well, so uh, um, Leon Pettis also has a brother as well, right? Yeah, um, Kato Kona is his name. He fought uh, Nori in Nori's last fight. You should look it up. It was really brutal. Okay. Um, actually, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, um, Shiro and uh, Kumura. Here's the thing I've always uh, about Shiro is that um, Shiro, here's, he's, he's so technical that it's almost kind of, I don't want to say boring to watch, but he kind of sometimes is. I mean, he had the nice KO against Rui, so... But like for the most, like that Grand Prix, uh, all the the Grand Prix has been in. He's kind of been yeah, so technical. Or his fights versus tension. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm surprised. What is million fights they've had so far because he wins every tournament in a rise. So it's. Uh, I used to call him the uh, John Fitch of Japanese kickboxing because he was. Yeah. You know, he's always a second spring guy, and he was always one of the best. Mm-hmm. But he couldn't just quite beat the top guy who's a bit more flashier and more solid versus him. I think he, you know, he got a string of pretty good KOs and KDs recently. So he's mm-hmm. turning it up a bit. I do like him, but he is uh, probably the reason why he's below Suzuki in terms of my expectations of him is just, uh, you know, his recent string of mm-hmm. uh, fight and his style. Actually, I, I totally forgot. There's actually uh, two more fights that you can talk about briefly if you have any thoughts on them. Uh, Yuki Kasahara versus Chihiro Nakajima and then Kazane versus uh, Tomo Kuruda. I think uh, Kazane versus Kuroda is a more interesting of those two fights. Um, they're both at 53 kgs. They just invented those weight classes. Mm. And they're basically two Grand Prix winners and they're hoping to put them up against each other and see whether they can stir up hype in their new division. Kazane just fought tension if you remember that fight it's pretty close yeah. uh, no that was that was legitimately like very a very close fight and uh, not that tension he clearly won but clearly i don't know if it's just because they train together and because i knows a little a little bit extra but like yeah because i really held his own against tension and i got it i got him some pretty good shots on him uh, yeah especially in the first i'd say um the what do you think about do you think that he has what what his future is could be potentially um, as a kickbox, oh, as a kickboxing personality, do you think he could be, um, a bigger name, Kazane? It's hard to say because when I think about it, then what the hurdle for being a great kickboxing personality is, my hurdle is Takeru Tenshin Masato, people who can basically front run for TV and have millions of people watching that aren't kickboxing fans. Mm-hmm. In that perspective, I would not say Kazane, you know, has shown the type of highlight real KOs and have shown the type of personality I would expect from someone like that. Mm-hmm. Not to say he's not, you know, technical and he's been in a lot of really tough fights versus really tough opponents, especially over the last year. But the issue is, you know, if and it's true for the rest of this card, but there is so much talent at 53 to 57.5 kgs in Japan that there's, you know, 12 guys that are probably competitive with him. And it's hard to see who's going to break out and really become the next star. What I liked about uh, Kazan is, is kind of like his whole backstory was that he was kind of, he's kind of like a, if you you know you when you brought up that talk, it was like last in his class in kickboxing. I feel like Kazani. It feels like Kazani kind of has like a similar. Is that kind of am I get if, from the way that I I've heard I've heard him speak in post fights? He seemingly like is a very passionate about kickboxing and it, it has a lot of heart and seemingly is kind of like almost yeah was kind of like the guy who never thought he could be a kickboxer and then be and then becomes one. Yeah, I think that's uh, pretty true, especially for his last 53 kg Grand Prix. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the 53 kg Grand Prix had a lot of pretty 
renowned fighters on it. And Kazane was uh, seen to be probably the least, ac- I wouldn't say least accomplished, but the least favorite coming in. Um, and then he had three really tough fights and they all went through really close decisions and he prevailed. So I think he has a bit of a chip on his uh, shoulder. Mm-hmm. When um, he beat uh, Ebata Mutsuki um, last year, he got on the mic and said, did you see that, you idiot? So, you know, <laughs> it's probably his thing. And he, at this point, he's been in a lot of really close fights versus good fighters, but he has, I would not say he has had a highlight star-making performance. So I'd expect that's what he's looking for versus Kuroda. Okay, there's a, uh, I, I missed so many comments in the, in the chat. I'm going to read them quickly. Oh, yeah. uh, Jamie says, Kento seems to have become a poor man's Yamazaki. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, Amateur Bushido says, co-main event is Friday night. Uh, B. Coutinho TSMA says, Nori is the truth. Um, oh, what's up? Uh, Jamie says, it's a shame how underappreciated Nori is. Uh, um, amateur she just says most exciting fighter. Oh my god, Nori has so many fucking fans right now. I don't know if he realizes like how many people like are like, oh, this guy's like so good, so good, like un- most underappreciated. Um, Nori didn't even have a Twitter account until this year. He is a major boomer. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, amateur Pichito says, uh, Kaido is a good kickboxer too. Uh, also, Pettis should be Khan. Uh, and Slavonek says Kazane, Kazane is the easiest win for Rise on this card. Uh, I would, I don't <laughs> know if I'd agree with that to be honest, just because Kazane's style is more, you know, it's more methodical, it's more irking out points when he can. Mm-hmm. And Kuroda, he's probably one of the, you know, not one of the standout guys from the K1 side, but he is someone I'd say probably has a power advantage. And he can't surprise people, so I uh, it might not be quite as one sided as you might think. Um, uh, Yuki Kasahara, Chihiro Nakajima, uh, Kasahara, true boxer, fought on Ryzen. I think it was, I think it was last year. Yeah, he was part of that of that show where all the kickboxers finished their fights. I think, and then like all the MMA fights went to like decision. And then uh, it's nice when that happens. Oh know. yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> Get the card done. Uh, what, oh, what can you tell us about Chihiro Nakajima? Um, so he, I wouldn't. Okay, it, it's hard to talk about uh, Chihiro. So one of the odd things about him is that he was this Kyokushin guy. He did Kyokushin karate, and he was the uh, in a couple of um, Grand Prix on that side back in 20, um, 2016 or 2017 or something. And then he basically decided to transition to kickboxing uh, when he was past the midpoint of his 20s. And he joined uh, what's called Power Dream Gym, which is um, a pretty famous gym within the kickboxing world. And I think he's still in the midpoint of going from a karate type fighter to being a kickboxer. What I mean by that is, you know, he's pretty flat footed. He doesn't quite use his boxing combinations as much, but he has immensely powerful kicks. And sometimes he can use those to keep his distance and go for the KO. Other times it looks like he doesn't know what he's doing out there. So it's a bit of a wild card to see what version of him comes out on this fight. I think Kasahara, you know, he's on a winning streak. He's much more of an accomplished kickboxer. I think it should be probably one of the easier fights for the uh, non-K1 guys on this card. Uh, actually, someone was kind enough uh, on the Tapology discussion page. They pa- they they posted Nori's uh, karate highlights and his k1 highlights so if you if you want to if you don't want to search on youtube they're all over just they're the first things on, on the tapology thing so i'm going to definitely look at those after uh when i'm talking um obviously the most important match of the of the show uh karev ryuji nasakawa younger brother of uh tension and uh rui okubo the two uh, i guess two potential future prospects of their respective promotions what do you think about uh, what do you think about them op- having this as the opener um it's odd since they 
both only have one fight, I suppose. I know it's six Kubo outs. Rui <laughs> actually is, you know, a very promising prospect. Uh, he's only had one pro fight so far, but it was extremely dominant. He was in K1's uh, Koshian division, which is their high school branch. And he was probably one of their best champs over the last couple of years. So I think it should be pretty one-sided in his favor. The thing about the whole Nasukawa family that's I find a bit odd is, you know, they have dad, uh, daddy Nasukawa, and he was never a pro fighter, but he decided one day that he was going to train his children to become is fighting. This, it sounds similar to um, what uh, Tiger Woods' father did. Oh, yeah, definitely. The thing is, though, right, um, Ryujin is a third, I think, sibling to get a professional debut in kickboxing. Mm. And, you know, tension was a huge hit. But his sister, Riri, you know, she sort of faded out. And I think most people think she's retired at this moment. So, I heard that. I heard she's retired. She's like working at a, at a store or something. She's working like uh, she's working like an actual like nine to five job, apparently. OK, I mean, you know, good for her. Right. But. So I guess Ryujin decides whether Papa Masukawa has great genes slash great uh, training style. Mm-hmm. Um, what what strikes me about uh, Okubo when I watched his uh, his one sole fight uh, uh, at um at the K one is how tall he is for his weight. He is yeah, like, and he keeps tall. going down in weight too. I think this fight is at fifty kgs or something, oh, which is five kilo- kilograms lower than where he competed as an amateur. So he keeps uh, getting, getting taller and fighting lighter. So, because uh, the fight that he had um, against, uh, oh God, I can't remember, even remember the guy's name. i um, too lazy to look it up. But uh, he was so tall, he managed to knee him, like 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 give him, like knock him down on a knee without even like having to jump. That's how tall he was. That's like, yeah. you know, I, I never, I, I've only seen that, I've only seen that happen once before. It was on a PFL fight, but I've never seen it happen in a kickboxing fight. Oh, um, look up uh, Nori's highlight. That's sort of his thing. I'm going to be going on, on, on a Nori uh, deep dive after this. Um, yeah, I mean, if there's anything that you take from this, it's that you should watch Nori. There, you know, both Takeru and Tenshin say he is the you know, one of the best, probably the best Japanese kickboxer right now. Uh, oh, so Avanek says, Charles Oliveira, um, UFC lightweight champion, I think. I don't even know. I can't remember. Yeah. Okay, because I remember he missed weight. And I thought they stripped him. I'm not even. Oh, sure. th- yeah, they did, right? Yeah. Or did, I, I thought they handed <laughs> he, him. They stripped him, but he won the fight, didn't he? Yeah. Uh, so maybe champion is also a Nori fan too. So Nori ha- seems okay. So why 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 focus on Suzuki or uh, or uh, anybody else? You know, as the next. It sounds like Nori might be just the next guy that like. I mean, he's also a veteran, right? He's older than uh, Takeru. Oh, he's he just is? been around okay. forever. Okay. And he's just been continuously putting up good fights or winning versus everyone he's come up against. Uh, Leona says Okubo looks like a skeleton a week out. That does not sound good at yeah. all. <laughs> um, Takeru so- also looks like a skeleton, and that was three months ago. So oh, Christ. I, I, I don't know how that's going to go for him. Uh, so I want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, as we come to the end of this, like, Reb, wh- uh, this attention uh, Takaru fight, what, it, what, it, why is it significant to you as a kickboxing fan? Why, why is, is it? Would you say this is the most important fight as a fan that you will probably see in quite a while, or the, and that you have that you will see? Yes, that you will see in quite a while. Yeah, I mean, I say it's the most important fight I've seen in at least the last twelve years. Um, and basically, what happened, and it's really hard to communicate this to people who weren't around when K1 was a thing, but back in the 90s, K1 was this huge television sensation. And it wasn't that, you know, <clears throat> K1 was as big as UFC or something. It was K1 was on TV almost every uh, month or so, <clears throat> and millions of people watched it. It was basically this 90s fad on par with Pokemon. People literally made K1 Tamagotchis. That's how big it was. And one, you know, there was this entire generation of people that grew up watching it. And back in 2010, it stopped being a thing. It wasn't on television anymore. It stopped being a viable career route for people. And people assume the sport of uh, kickboxing was gone forever. So, you know, 
in that dark age, it was basically Takeru Intention who said, hey, I'm going to bring that back. I'm going to build my entire career towards getting uh, competitive striking port, uh, sports back on television and in making sure that there's going to be a new generation of people who grew up watching kickboxing again, you know, became like me. But the thing is, those two guys were off building their own organizations and they were basically at war with each other. So, you know, this isn't just like a fight between two pound for four pound fighters. It's not a fight between a massive pressure fighter versus an elusive counter puncher. This is basically two people who claimed they were going to be the messiah of Japanese fight fans and them showing up and proving one or the other is a fraud. So, you know, I'm a bit scared to watch it, but uh, it is definitely the biggest uh, fight I've seen in the last 12 years. Is it kind of the anticipation kind of just like, is it, is, is it just the lead up? It, it's kind of, you know, like the idea of a Tenten Takaru match is great, but then is it the worry that as soon as that gong hits that, you know, almost a feeling, you know, that, you know, that's that imagination of the imagination is better than the actual physical representation of this fight happening. I think that's one part of it. I think another part of it is just no matter how this fight ends, it's going to be the end of one of them, not just in terms of their active careers, but of their legacies, what they said they were building up to be. Yeah, it's sort of like you're leading, reading Le Miz and you don't want um, Javert to catch a Valjean because if you, it happens, it proves that one of them is a fraud. So, yeah. yeah. Everyone who follows this fight says they sort of don't want this to happen. It's a bit too cruel. It would especially be cruel if Takeru lost, uh, but we'll see. Um, Jamie in the chat says, as much as you want as we want Nori Kaito, I would have liked to have seen Nori face an international foe. Um, I guess that was one of the things as well, is even though now things are a little bit more relaxed in Japan, everybody here is actually living in, in training in Japan, all these fighters, I believe, right? Yep. Um, do you think, let's just say if COVID wasn't a thing, do you think that's, do you think we would have seen more international fighters, you know, maybe come directly from Thailand or maybe America, Europe, or wherever else? Um, do you think it was always, this is, it was kind of just be like, you know, you're in, anybody who's in Japan. Mm. I think this was always going to be a K1 versus Rise card. So, mm -hmm. you know, it was always going to be the mainstays of those orcs. If mm -hmm. COVID hadn't happened, you know, before COVID, both K1 and Rise had been bringing aboard a lot of foreign fighters and building up some of them as being, you know, true mainstays in their organizations. And unfortunately, that sort of just fell out of the picture since they can't come to Japan anymore. So... Mm -hmm. It probably would have happened in the sense that, you know, Japanese kickboxing would have been more international overall. But this was always going to be a uh, K1 versus Rise showdown. I will, I wouldn't have expected someone international to face Noiri on this card, unless someone at 65 or 70 kgs in Rise was an international fighter that was their champion. Uh, Teep uh, says Enzo. Kalzage was a musician before training his son Joe. And Savanek says Nori is 29, which is younger than Takru. Um, oh, is he? I, I, I see that's up. so crazy to me because mm. Nori was 16, 12, yeah, 13 years ago when he first made his television debut. And he's had a kid since. He's had two kids. And he's still in his 20s. That's insane. Let me, let me double check this. Okay, so Takaru is 30. So he's a year older than uh, Nori. Yeah, I mean, just to put it into perspective, uh, Takaru also tried out for the high school Grand Prix. Nori won, but he got kicked out of the regional Grand Prix uh, pretty early on. So, mm -hmm. you know, he's always been sort of this guy that was not considered to be a prospect, not considered to be someone with a future in professional kickboxing. But somehow, you know, he's just gotten better with age. So actually, one, 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 one major, one mass major question I ha have, and it's a name I just noticed is not there. And I forgot that he is in K1, Minoru Kimura. Is he oh, uh, so he retired. <laughs> oh, he retired. <laughs> I oh, wouldn't I say he retired. Um, 
I think this was end of last year, but he basically said he was going to have a K1 last match. And uh, it was unclear what he was going to do after that. Uh, but basically, he lost versus Wajima, who is fighting Bay Noah, and Wajima took his belt. And, Bay, you know, he's sort of been in a uh, limbo ever since. People expected him to go to MMA, but it seems like he's going to boxing. Um, but, you know, who knows when that happens. Don't you know? He's got it all wrong. When you say you retire from uh, combat sport, you're supposed to go in the bare knuckle. That's the rule. Yeah. Nobody to- he yeah. do pretty good in bare knuckle, I say. <laughs> That's Even one, though you know his chin is pretty shot. That's the one thing we need a we need a, a Japanese bare knuckle fighting company. I don't know. Maybe 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 Rise will do that. Maybe they'll do a no glove. You know they're, they're like that oh, might they, happen. Yeah, they go from fingers gloves. Now they're going to do a, a Rise Fight Club Part Two. Will be uh will be no gloves instead. Yeah, I mean uh, all karate or you know full contact kyokushin karate is no glove bare fist right, and they just didn't do uh, facial punches, but. Maybe they'll get to that one day. Uh, our friend CJ in chat, he says he lost the crazy horse. Oh, we, we all we all remember that. I'm sure. Yeah, but that's because crazy horse is a interdimensional, once in a lifetime super lord. <laughs> and you know, he's only pretending to be on a 15 fight or something losing streak to get our guards down and then he's exactly. going for that UFC belt. Exactly. Yeah, no, that, that that's how it is. But for, he's got for you know, he's he's gotta defend his cam soda. Uh, win streak eventually. So, but uh, after that, he's definitely come to the USC. Um, so I, I think you said that you're looking forward to the. Uh, what, so other than talk retention, what's the one other fight that you are that you are definitely not going to take a, go to the bathroom during? Uh, what is like the one? Uh, I, I know you mentioned that you're looking forward to a lot of fights, but yet what? Let me, let me have you pick one. If I had to pick one, I say Nori versus Kaito. Hmm. But there's probably like seven must-watch fights on this. It's just so hard to get through it all. Um, our friend Daniel uh, from Poland says Minoru could go to the ILFJ and do left way. Um, oh, oh, maybe. I, 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 I like left way, but I just I'm, I get disturbed when I just see people headbutting each other, and it's just like I don't know the art of five limbs. I don't know. I like I prefer the art of four limbs. I like people, not that. Game punch in the face is any safer than probably being headbutted, but I don't know. <laughs> the headbutting only always makes me a little squeamish. That's me though. Um, yeah, and the uh, whole resurrecting people after knockouts and stuff. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. That somebody has to be knocked, has to be like not, has to be literally unconscious, borderline dead to be declared a loser. Um. So um, yeah. So uh uh. uh Karev, I gotta, I gotta say, you know, what, what will be the, what, what's the next big, uh, big match that could be made after this, after Tension Takru and kickboxing? I, I'll, I'll, I'll ask specifically, is there, can there even be one at this point? I think what they're counting on is for the winner of Kaneko versus Suzuki to prove themselves as the next top guy at fifty-five to sixty kgs. Then that guy can fight the winner of Takeru Tension which can only be Takeru because Tenshin is going to go to boxing. So best case scenario, you know, Kaneko or Suzuki win so decisively that they pick up promotional steam and challenges Takeru, who happens to win. And do, do you ever foresee a, this type of co-promotional thing happening ever again? Or do you think this, it sounds like it was a headache to even just get everybody in the same room? So, or do you think this is just gonna be like a one-time thing and that, you know. Yeah, what? so the uh, K1 producer said this isn't gonna be an annual thing that they mandate, but they will do it if there is another big match that people are looking forward to. So it could be three months from now, it could be 30 years from now. So we'll see, right? And that's, you know, why I'm paying attention to the undercard. Mm-hmm. It's going to make a huge difference whether someone with star potential like Rukia or Kaneko or Suzuki or whoever uh, really pops out and takes this. Actually about Rukia. I want, I'm curious to know what is the relationship that he and Ren Hiramoto have? Cause I always, I, I, I don't trust Twitter translations, but I always see them talking to each other. And I don't know if, yeah, it's, like well, or if it's like friendly banter. Um, it is somewhat homoerotic I'd say. And that's not my words. That's the words they use. You know, they pretend to be ducking each other or fighting each other or 
uh, you know, proposing to each other, literally. It's just, you know, they're both guys that are pretty flamboyant and been basically in TV businesses since they were children. So, you know, they're playing it up. I think uh, Ren, I don't know what he's been doing over the last four years or so. Oh, he's been uh, on Bazooka uh, sh- yeah. uh, shaking his dick around. Uh, uh, yeah. That's what he's been doing, apparently. <laughs> so I don't know how proactive he's been in this trading, how up to par he would be if he was a kickboxer coming back to the sport right now. Uh, but he is a personality and he, he's someone rookie I can work off of. So it should be fun. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, CJ wants to know which fight should I walk my dog during? <laughs> uh, Sinacaramian versus. Oof, gosh, I can't. Oh, man, I'm having trouble remembering the name of this. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll help you there. Yamashita. Uh, Yamashita, yes, right here. Yeah, yeah. Yamashita. Um, well, that fight won't, may not even last a minute, CJ. So you better go for a run with your dog, uh, yeah. because it's a heavyweight fight. So probably, probably someone's gonna get knocked out quickly. Uh, and Jamie says, holding hope for Ren Rukia 2023 at the Budokan. I can only hope. I If it happens, I think the hype for it will be bigger than Takeru Bruce's tension. Ah, see? Just because, I mean, not like, you know, mainstream-wise, but <laughs> in terms of what they're going to do at the press conference, it's probably going to be bigger than Yama versus Ashizawa. Oh, that's even better. Now, now I'm excited. Now now yeah. you, got, you got me excited already. You got I'm really excited now for that match. Uh, for 2023, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh. I. Uh. Oh. And um. What? Uh. Floyd Mayweather versus Meek Rue. Do you think that's really good? What they're going to announce? Well, I hope I, not. I really hope. I, not. I mean, like, what else could it be though? It's happening in a day or something, isn't it? The announcement. Yeah. Thirteenth. Uh, uh, oh yeah, that's tomorrow. That's actually tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Or today, <laughs> or whatever it is. No, no, it's got to be tomorrow. No, it's tomorrow. I think. Mm-hmm. So. It'll, the thing I don't get about it is if it happens, there's no Fuji television deal. So who even watches that, right? Oh, sorry. I'm still here. I'm still here. Don't worry. Oh, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, go ahead. You were saying about there's no television deal. I was thinking that. Yeah, because there's no television deal. Who's going to watch this? How are they, yeah. gonna, are they hoping or are they hoping that this will get them back on television? I don't know, man. If it does, is it really good for anybody involved? <laughs> um, payday wise, maybe. Oh, a Slavonic says Mayweather Gomi. No. Oh, that can't uh, be. I can't see no, Mayweather is good. He'd be like, "Who is this guy? Who who is this drunk Japanese guy who with with this big giant head who's talking?" Oh no, he's not. That's it's not going to be. It's. It, I mean, to be fair, I'm sure he thinks that about everyone that's a potential candidate for him on the rising. I guess so. Yeah, I guess so. Um, uh, yeah. Any last thoughts that you want to say about the, about the tension talk route or any other match uh, Karev before, uh, before we head out? Yeah. I mean, uh, obviously the international pay-per-view situation is a bit complicated. Uh, I, you know, I'd be hopeful uh, in terms of being able to watch it live. And if it does, it's a long car. So obviously you know, you guys don't need to tune in for it for long, but there's so many good fights here. There's probably 10 fights on this card that could just be a headliner of their own events. And uh, it's going to be a great day for kickboxing. I hope you all tune in. I'm going to be watching from the Tokyo Dome. So, you know, it's a moment of celebration and hope you guys all tune in with us. I'm going to just wink and say, Karev fan, Periscope, wink, wink. Well, the thing is, I have a pay-per-view <laughs> that I may or may not be able to uh, divulge to a public audience, but I will oh, also no, be no, no, no. arena. No. So, you know. of course, no, 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 no. Of course, you wouldn't do. You wouldn't do that. No, 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 no. Because you know, listen, you know, it's that what you, know, you would never do such activities. No, absolutely not. Uh, uh, Daniel says, "Remember Mega Twenty Twenty One with Mayweather? Whatever happened with that? Did that just die out? Because I thought wasn't that supposed wasn't Mayweather bringing that to Japan because Japan had just legalized betting and and um gambling. Well, the thing is, they didn't like casinos still aren't a thing here. Online gambling is not a thing here. I think you know he heard it was something that might be in the works, and since he was already able to do an exhibition, he might have been looking into it, but. You know, the whole legislation there is going to take another decade or something. So, 
you know, it was never a great uh, timing. So it's the same thing with like COVID. Uh, Japan won't reopen until about 10 or 15 years from now. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's actually reopening in two days or something. Um, there's a bunch of international fighters on the K1 female card, funnily enough. But, yeah. Um, this is the uh, the uh, guided tour thing that I call it the North Korea tour. Where they're, um, where they're having like the people of the tour groups only go in designated places, I believe. Um, no, I think no, it's I thought, just, uh, you know, it's just opening borders for tourists. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, okay. I thought, I thought they were just doing the thing with the guy at tours. That's why I thought, um, you had to register with the, uh, government and all that stuff. That's why I thought, um, I could, yeah, be, there I, might be, uh, you know, uh, registration you have to do, but <laughs> I'm expecting to see uh, more international talent back on Japanese kickboxing in a few months. Oh, I hope so. I hope so too. Um, but yeah, correct. where can people reach you? Uh, and also plug the Beyond Kickboxing Discord as well. Yeah, I'm not actually on the Beyond Kickboxing Discord, but uh, you oh, guys I can, thought you were. Oh, I apologize. I thought you were. You guys can reach me at uh, Twitter at Karai Fan. Um, I uh, I am always free and available to speak on these things. So hope you guys retain interest in kickboxing. It's going to be a great couple new years. So. Uh, mm -hmm. check out the match and I'll see you all later. Yep. And you could catch up. You can follow us. We are rising pod, uh, YouTube channel, uh, our Twitter, right? We are rising pod YouTube channel. Obviously you're here and obviously you know what that is. And if you want to follow my personal account where I just post about pro wrestling, you can uh, follow me at a Benjamin one and uh, you can catch the match uh, June 19th. Uh, what's the official start time? Uh, uh, it's starting 13 o'clock 1 p.m japan standard time okay because they, they moved it up i think right it was yeah they moved it up an hour okay so whatever that is uh 1 p.m uh you know look it up because i don't I, I can't i'm too so i'm too tired to be doing uh uh time conversions but uh it's gonna be a long card but i think this could potentially be one of the best kickboxing cards maybe since like the k1 uh grand prix that had uh mark hunt and uh crow cop in it i think this is gonna be i think this, this is gonna be one one of the best this could be one of the best combat show sports shows like this year maybe of all time if everything goes right hopefully hopefully <laughs> yeah god, god only knows what's gonna happen you know i feel like there's always some sort of news that comes out like oh you know what's gonna happen this week oh we got Yakuza one week. We got uh, Fuji TV. We got potentially almost losing Tokyo Dome. What can happen next? Oh, earth, an earthquake is going to be is predicted for June 19th. Like that's like the worst case scenario. And they can't run the show or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, uh, thank you again, Karev. And uh, hopefully uh, you'll all get to watch the show uh, somehow. Wink. <laughs>